Good evening and thank you to everyone for joining us for what should be an excellent and exciting webinar with Thomas Mateos, hosted by the Rogers Scruton Centre. My name is William Hayes, I'm a second year politics student at Newcastle University and the chairman of this, the University's Conservative Society. The Rogers Scruton Centre for the Study of Western Civilization is an organisation which ensures the importance of the ideas and works of the late Sir Roger Scruton preserved and promoted. The centre is dedicated to furthering understanding around Western civilization and the new unique value of this shared inheritance. By working with the UK universities, public institutions, government and think tanks, the centre also seeks to strengthen defenders of the West and its allies and improve pub public knowledge for the benefits of, its le of our leaders and citizens. Legacy of Roger Scruton also continues through the work of his family at Scrutopia, which hosts a summer school at the Scruton's beautiful Manor Farm. I must now thank the partners for the event this evening. Thank you to my university society, Blue Beyond, Essex University Conservative Society, and Reading University Conservatives Association. Your support is very much appreciated. Our distinguished speaker tonight is Thomas Mateus. Thomas is an entrepreneur and investor into sustainable materials and technologies. He created the, he's created Central Asia's lead, leading waste paper and plastic recycling companies. He's also founder and partner of Werner Capital alongside being a successful businessman. He pursued an MA in philosophy at Buckingham University under the supervision of Roger, Roger Scruton. He is currently a PhD candidate in philosophy at Buckingham University. This evening, Thomas will be speaking about the, top, the topic of a conservative view of the economy. This is important for several reasons in my view. Partly because it shortens the line of supply and um, helps to guarantee traceability within communities. That's kind of how, where and who we're getting our food from. Um, helping to strengthen, also because the line of supply is short, helping to strengthen accountability. This creates reinvestment into local economies by locals, creating stronger communities and creates cohesion through this economic fraternity. And um, how to do this is, I suppose, just some ideas before Thomas gives us a much more... Um, much more educated and um, professional idea of, of this. I, I would say would be to raise the threshold for VAT liability to support small businesses, constrain corporations and aid small slash medium businesses by introducing a progressive corporation tax, more money for small business startup grants, huge reform to public procurement policy and public sector, public sector bodies should always, or at least where, where possible, try and use British firms and where feasible from the locality in which they're based. And I think to paraphrase G.K. Chesterton, Bolshevism and big business are very much alike in the fact that they share common enemies, small business, enterprise and variety. And that's why it's important that we don't succumb to either. <laughs> and um, tonight, chairing the event will be Charlie Woods, who's a programme director at the Roger Scruton Centre. Thank you again, and I hope that you all enjoy the event as much as, as, much as I will. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, William. I now will hand over to Thomas. Thank you, William, for the, for the wonderful introduction. Thank you, uh, thank you, Charles. Good evening, everybody. So today, we're here to talk about uh, Roger Scruton's uh, thoughts on the economy. As William mentioned, I'm, I'm Thomas Mateos Werner, and I have been kindly invited by the Centre to talk about Roger because I was a student, but I think also because I'm an entrepreneur and not an academic. An entrepreneur operating at the geographical and moral edge of our capitalist system, that is in Central Asia, as William mentioned. For me, groping with Roger's thinking and philosophy comes from a practical need to understand what to do and how to behave on a daily basis. Let me just say it at the outset, what my objective is tonight. I will walk away thinking that I've achieved something if you start losing the fear of using some of the words and concepts that are central to Roger's view about the economy. Words like home, membership, beauty, and nation. You will therefore, thereby have stepped out of a frame of mind that sees the economy in purely utilitarian terms. If you do so, I think you will be able to spread the case for a reinvigorated capitalism. So let us see how I fare. Roger Scruton, allow me to call him Roger because that's uh, how I called him when I was a student, is primarily known as a philosopher and as a political thinker. He has been called by some the preeminent British conservative thinker since Edmund Burke. I will argue tonight that Roger also had, although less well known, a coherent economic outlook. He never wrote a book about economics, and his comments on economic issues are scattered over a number of essays and contributions, as if he considered his economic views to be of less philosophical importance. It is possible, though, to reconstruct a coherent picture of his economic thinking. Why does this matter if it didn't seem to matter to Roger? It matters because it, will, it helps to qualify Roger's very idea of what he thought a conservative to be. 
and this matters in our current debate about capitalism. As will emerge from, from his, this talk uh, tonight, his was a, a very particular brand of conservatism, one that relies on conservative ideas, not as an ideology, but as a way of seeing the world, a conservative with a small C. What does his view actually amount to? To put it succinctly, Roger accepts the central tenet of liberalism, i.e. that markets work, but he will also argue that we have to respond in non-economic terms to some of the obvious things that markets by themselves cannot achieve. This is the idea of settlement, of home, oikophilia, as Roger likes to call it. This is, and this is what distances him from what I will call classical economic conservatism. Classical or mainstream or, or whatever you want to call them, conservatives, include, I submit, thinkers of the so-called Austrian school of economics, such as, such as Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises, but also Milton Friedman and Murray Rothbard of the Chicago School, if those names are familiar to you. I will argue that Rogers' conservatism is much more rooted, though, in Kant's categorical imperative, in Husserl's Lebenswelt, in Burke's hereditary principle, and in Hegel's ethical order. This also distances him from most of the current conservative parties in power, such as the British Conservatives and until recently the American Republicans, and has contributed to a certain outsider status ignored by who are supposed to be his own ideological friends. I submit though, that it is Roger who has the better answer to our current social woes. So let me attempt to outline it. Roger believes that the foundation of the economic order is to be found in the proper operation of the market mechanism. We can clearly distinguish Hayek's echoes and worldview when Roger says that markets are characterized by a certain kind of order. This is not an order imposed from above. This is not an order <laughs> imposed from above, but a spontaneous order. It is a distinction that the Greeks made when they spoke of taxis and cosmos. The first one, taxis, being an ordered order imposed from above, whereas cosmos, is a spontaneous order, an order that is not imposed, but discovered. This distinction has been lost in, in, the, in the word order that we use nowadays, but it is crucial to understand how markets work. And this is how markets work. People, each of us, have desires, needs, and resources, which constitute a pool of information, of knowledge. This knowledge is dispersed throughout society and not the, uh, the property of any of us. In the free exchange of goods and services, the price mechanism provides access to this knowledge by solving multiple equations mapping individual demand against supply. In contrast, when prices are fixed by a central authority, they do not longer provide an index of the scarcity of a resource. The crucial piece of economic knowledge has been destroyed. I don't think this is controversial, but I wanted to make an aside at this point of something that, that puzzles me and that might puzzle you and that we might be able to discuss later in the, in the debate. What is, I, I said that how the market mechanism works is not controversial, but what is controversial is the following. Liberal thinkers have always maintained that for the market to work, you need to be able to appropriate the result of this exchange in the form of property. Property requires freedom and the rule of law to be enforced. The issue is then, how can you have a country like China with this limited economic freedom and certainly no rule of law and respect for property and still China delivers economic prosperity? This is a puzzle. Suffice to say that I don't have an answer to this puzzle, but I'm happy to hear if somebody else does. Let us return to our narrative. Knowledge, we said, will be destroyed when we advance collectively to our goals by adopting a common plan under the leadership of some central authority, such as the state. This Roger calls the planning fallacy, and I literally quote from him, it is the fallacy of believing that societies can be organized as armies are organized, with a top-down system of commands and a bottom-up system of accountability, ensuring the successful coordination of the many around a plan devised by the few. It actually leads to total breakdown of the incentives that allow economies to grow and provide security and opportunities to its members. The result, queues, shortages, gluts, and a black economy at which prices and things are exchanged at their real price, which is the price that people are prepared to pay for it. This is something that, that we all are, are aware from the, from the last years of the Soviet Union and the Maoist China. 
But at a more fundamental level, and this affects our societies as well, it has more perverse results. More state intervention only leads, on the one hand, to grow a class of self-perpetuating bureaucrats, and on the other hand, to a society with an underclass of people who do not work and who find every means to avoid work in order to enjoy the benefits provided by the state. We have hereby established that Roger endorses the market mechanism in no uncertain terms. But beyond this, we will see Roger's views are not liberal. Liberals, including Hayek and reluctantly the libertarians, admit that the market is not the only spontaneous order. In fact, they say the market is held in place by other forms of spontaneous order, such as customs and legal traditions. That is why liberals can say that in a, tr in a true spontaneous order, the constraints to the markets are already there. And there's no point in intervening because whatever is not there spontaneously cannot be recreated by fiat. Fine, says Roger, but are we not missing something? Liberals see spontaneous order as the default position of human society, this being so securely established that it does not even need to be mentioned. In fact, Roger contends, spontaneous order is like democracy, a rare achievement extracted with great cost from the default position of mankind, which is tyranny. Roger says civilization is simply not just there. That is also why the social contract theory, one of the way liberals have in history so to explain how society comes together, cannot be right. This theory, which is associated with Hobbes, Rousseau and, and Locke, lets us believe that society is founded on a social contract freely entered by, it, by its members, who then become constituted as a society. This could not be further away from reality, though, Roger claims. Contracts do not create bonds in society, but depend on them. Without membership, there is no motive to obey the contract, rather than to pretend to obey it, to reap the advantages of other people's obedience. The truer picture is one of the person that does not predate society, but emerges out of it. What about social democracy? a political option that, although in retreat nowadays, has been predominant to various degrees in post-war Europe. Roger specifically addresses the social market economy that served as an inspiration to Ludwig Erhard, the super minister in charge of the German economic post-war miracle. Very briefly, the social market economy is an economic model that combines free market alongside guarantees of fair competition and a welfare state. Although social democratic parties are rarely in power these days, we actually live in a social democratic consensus that is very much at the root of the European Union. Roger criticizes the second attempt at taming the market. He's very dismissive of the word social, which he says is a weasel word that sucks the meaning out of any expre expression the same way weasel sucked the content of an egg. What Roger has to criticize is that it tries to give to the social question an economic solution as if a form of economic order could be developed which would deliver social cohesion as a benign byproduct. No, the attempt to establish an economic order through state intervention is already to accept one of the most damaging of Marxist ideas, which is that social institutions are the byproduct rather than the foundation of the economic order. So where does Roger stand? To advance his argument, Markets and the economy have to embed it into a wider system of meaning. Central to this is the idea of oikophilia. Let us first try to understand what Roger means exactly with oikophilia. Oikophilia is the love of oikos. Oikos is the home in Greek. So oikophilia is the love of home. The word oikos, as you probably have guessed already, also appears in the word oikonomia, from which actually our word economy is derived. And this is actually the true objective of the economy, Roger thinks, to provide a place of settlement, a home. When Roger speaks about a home, though, he's not thinking primarily about the geographical space. The home is so much more. From a psychological point of view, the experience of home is core to the experience of attachment. The home is not merely where we start from, but the place of memory to which our longings always return. But home is more than just a form of attachment. It is the precondition of the political. And this is the idea behind the Greek polis. Home extends to those we love and need. It is the place that we share, the place that we defend, the place for which we might still be commanded to fight and die. 
at least in those countries that have a military service. It is the foundation of our democracies. Democracy means living with strangers in, in terms that maybe in the short term is advantageous. Only where people have a strong sense of who we are and why we are, will they adopt collective decisions as their own. This first person plural, the we, is a precondition of the political, the locus where it all takes place, and as we will see later, what gives legitimacy to the nation state. This is the idea. The problem is that today's hypermobility sets communities in motion. We're able to contract with another, regardless of all the physical and spiritual distance. The economy becomes anonymous and has a spectral quality where nobody takes responsibility. This creates, creates a huge sense of nostos, another Greek word, which means nostalgia, as you probably have, would have guessed. We're therefore constantly seeking a place of rest, as in the Odyssey, the refuge from change, change and stress. We will not find this place, though, in consumerism, Roger says which is the triumph of instrumental reasoning that turns somewhere into anywhere. And here I want to make another small aside, and I want to read you out Airbnbs, which you probably all know, latest missions, mission statement. It literally says, to live in the world where one day you can feel like you're home anywhere, and not in a home, but truly home where you belong. Shocking. Is this turning... Is this what Roger had in mind when he said that the, the objective of the economy is a place of settlement, the home? Or is this turning a somewhere into an anywhere, like, like he claims? Again, maybe somebody wants to pick up this question in, in, the, in the debate a little bit later. Roger says and continues, it should not be difficult to recognize that pleasure and happiness because here we're, we're, tr we're, we're trying to discuss the idea of consumerism, that pleasure and happiness are not the same. Literally, there are wicked pleasures, destructive pleasures, addictive pleasures, despicable pleasures, but there's no thing such as a wicked, destructive, addictive, or despicable happiness. I guess you will agree with me and with Roger. The happy person, Aristotle said, is in possession of this chief human good. It brings love for others and joy to all who encounter it. It is as far from pleasure as health is from intoxication. Pleasures are of many kinds, but those most dangerous to us come from consumption. When you consume a thing, when you just consume a thing, you also destroy it. For a brief moment, you're pleased to hold it in your hands, but your pleasure spells its doom. Down goes the hamburger or the glass of wine, and in its place, there comes this, uh, the stale feeling of being full, or if you read the stage of addiction, the slavish craving for more. In a world where all things around us are to be used, to be consumed, can we ever be at home? No, our world, our Lebenswelt has disappeared. What is this new strange word that I've just mentioned? What is Lebenswelt? Let me stop here for a moment and they explain you some philosophical assumptions that, un that lie underneath this concept because they are crucial to understanding Roger's stance on the economy and more importantly, how to approach his failings. And I hope I bring this philosophical concept in a, in, a, in a clear and simple way to you so that we can all follow them. We owe the concept of Lebensbelt to Edmund Husserl and those writing in the phenomenological tradition, but its foundations lie in the Kantian distinction between the nominal, the thing itself, and the phenomenal, how things appear to us. Roger will say that human beings live, live in a physical world, in a physical world, and seek to explain that world through science and causal laws. However, we also live in another world, a world to, to which our primary attitude is not of explaining like in science, but of belonging. This world is the world of life, the Lebensfeld. It is known through appearances, but these are not governed by how the world is, but how it appears to us. And how it appears to us depends on the meaning it has for us. That is why concepts such as home, beauty, and nation are of such importance, although they have no place in the laws of nature. They don't exist as such in the physical world. This, the same way that in a reductionist understanding of the economy, that is an economy that assumes that we're purely self-interested, maximum rational beings exist. You might have realized that we're in Kantian territory, a philosopher key to Roger's thinking. Kant said many things, 
that amongst others, he argued that reason alone compels us to do right by force comparable to the logic in compelling the conclusion to an argument. This is the Kantian categorical imperative, which tells us that we should act according to the maxim, which we could also at the same time will to be a universal law, treating all persons equal as ends in themselves and not as means. This recognizes that people are not only motivated by self-interest, but also by the conception of their place in the world and by a habit of being judged by others who can praise and blame us. It tells us to love and not to use, to respect and not to exploit. It is precisely for this reason and not because we're a utilitarian homo economicus like classical conservative economics tend to picture us that we can appeal to others as equal objects of respect, regardless of time, place, or personal connections. It therefore invites past and future people into our world. The idea of continuity, of inviting the past and the future into our world, leads us straight into Edmund Burke. Burke rejects the liberal idea of the social contract as a deal agreed among living people. Society, he argued, does not contain the living only. It is an association between the dead, the living, and the unborn. Its binding principle is not contract, but something more akin to trusteeship. It is a shared inheritance for the sake of which uh, we, we learn to limit our demands and to see our place in things as part of a continuous chain of giving and receiving. Concern, though, for future generations comes not from calculation, though, from thinking about glory and inheritance, but from gratitude, gratitude towards what is given, what has been given to us. And this gratitude is shown in the bonds of family, community, beauty, and respect for the sacred. These bonds, Burke believed, can only be built from below through face-to-face -face interaction. This is done by rebuilding forms of social membership, not by the state, but by the people, locally as William mentioned at the, very, at, at the introduction. It is in the family, in the local clubs, in school, in church, in, in team, in, in university, that people learn to interact as free beings, each taking responsibility for his actions and accounting to his neighbors. When society is organized from above, either by a top-down government, a revolutionary dictatorship, or by impersonal edicts of an inscrutable bureaucracy, then accountability rapidly disappears from the political order and from society too. And this is my final and third aside. I'm just reading out another mission statement, in this case, the mission statement of Facebook, which literally says, to give people the power to share and make the world more open and connected. Is this Birkin membership that uh, Facebook is, is promising us, or an attempt to translate the market power of some of these very successful monopolies in, into the political arena, with the risk of sub subverting the representative political process characteristic of our societies. And I, I only have to mention the, the actions, for example, Twitter and, and Facebook as well has taken uh, following the, re the recent American uh, election. A side closed, let me end on, on with Burke with one very interesting connection that he makes. He says that traditions are forms of knowledge. They contain many residues of many trials and errors, and they inherited solutions to problems that we all have encountered. His argument parallels the argument for the market, in which prices distill information about the indefinitely many stranger living now. In a similar way for Burke, traditions and customs distill information about the indefinitely many strangers living then. What an interesting parallel the market and, tra and, and tradition. Spontaneous coordination, characteristic of market, lies also at the root of another phenomenon that was central for Roger, which is beauty. For Roger, following Kant, beauty is an intrinsic value. To look on a thing as beautiful is to value it is for what it is, not for what it does or the purpose it serves. Beauty, understood this way, as a way of restoring and protecting intrinsic values, is a refuge against consumerism and therefore a place where we're spiritually at home. Like manners, table manners, for example, aesthetic conventions operate as site constraints, dictating not what we do, but the way we do it. 
so that whatever our goals, we advance to them gracefully and considerately. It does not follow, though, that beauty is useless. On the contrary, the intrinsic value of beautiful things, of beautiful things render them useful. We can see the importance of its aesthetic values in architecture, one of Rogers' most active commitments. Beauty, in the sense of a certain order, ensures that the primary requirement of every building, of every construction, is served, namely that it should be a fitting member of a community of neighbors. This is why the old cities of Europe, such as Florence and Rome, and the centers of London and Paris, are so popular, and the beautiful buildings and neighborhoods located in in them demand such exorbitant prices. I want to end the exploration of the various manifestations of the idea of home with one of Roger's crucial ideas, that is of the nation state. Roger is aware that in today's globalized, super turbocharged world, the small scale bottom up solutions are probably not enough to tackle complex interrelated economic issues. The response to this challenge is to base solutions on the territory, on the physical authority, and by this he means the nation state. Because as we saw when we talked about oikophilia, only a nation can elicit feelings of a shared home and appeal to ordinary, to ordinary people, and only nations are communities with a political shape that are predisposed to translate the feeling of common belonging into collective decisions and laws. Moreover, nations can and do take part in global decision making and can therefore give a voice to the collective sentiment of the members of a nation. That is why the attempt to subsume them in ever bigger supranational units leads to the decay of the bond that bind us together in the first place and is the reason why Roger was so skeptical of the European Union and other supranational institutions such as the United Nations. I think time has come up to, to wrap up We've not touched on every aspect of Roger's thoughts that relate to the economy, trust me. I have left out thinkers that have influenced him, such as Hegel or concept like the sacred. But I also think that we've covered enough ground to capture the essence of what Roger had to say about the economy. The market works. The market works. But only if we accept that his ultimate objective is to create a place of settlement. This is the essence of his conservatism conservatism with a small c. We were also wondering at the beginning of this talk why Roger had not expounded his economic ideas with more emphasis or even written a book about that. We can now intuit the answer, that the answer is to be found in his belief that it's not economic solutions that are going to deliver as a place of settlement, but concepts that cannot be redu reduced to utility alone, such as home, membership, and beauty. This is at the moment to return to the hope I expressed at the very beginning of our talk. I do not know how much progress I've made in my objective, but I certainly thank you for the opportunity giving to do so. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Thomas. To our audience, if you'd like to ask a question at the bottom, there is a Q&A box. If you type in your question, I'm happy to read it out to Thomas and we will go from there. Please don't be shy and we open it to you. Before that though, Thomas, I want to begin with a few questions of my own, if that's okay. Starting Go with, ahead. first of all, what inspired you to, get, to look into Roger's ideas on economics? As you said in your talk, it's one of these areas that he never distinctly wrote one exact work on, and therefore his ideas and thoughts are spread out across a range of writings. Why this particular avenue of Rogers? I mean, as I, as I mentioned, I, I never thought that, that Roger has had specific ideas of, about the, the, the economy. But then I, I've, I've stumbled uh, across one essay in, in, in particular, where he describes the, the actions of, of, a Ger of a German economist and philosopher, Wilhelm Röpke, that was the inspiration of, of, this, of the social market economy in, in, in Germany. And despite loving most of his, his, his ideas, he was he was very keen to 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 say that because Röpke was was trying with his social market economy to say that we have to find economic solution to so, to social problems, and he said he he says there very clearly no that's not that's not the essence of the problem. Yes, we have to find economic solutions as well, but the essence of the problem and the essence and the problem of the legit, legitimacy of the system and, and capitalism is, is that we have to, that the, the economy is not delivering these other things. 
that they're supposed to deliver, which is mainly to be a place of settlement and home. And again, I, I just exp I explained that Roger has this dualist view of, of the world where there's on the one side, there's the physical world, and then there's the world, how we, how we live it and how we perceive it. And obviously in the physical world, you have the market. It's the market that, that delivers the, the, the results. But the market alone is not, is not enough. And that's, that's where he, he differs from, from, from liberals or from laissez-faire libertarians. And, and he says, I mean, we actually live, we don't live in the physical world only. We live in a world of, of meaning. And in, in this world, these ideas of, of home and of beauty are extremely important. So this, this is, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur and I have to deal with, with economic issues on a, on a daily basis. And I do that in, in, a, in a country that, that sort of portrays probably the worst, the, the worst aspects of, of, of capitalism. Which is which is a cap capitalism without these spontaneous orders is a is a country that went from commun from communism to let's say wide west wide west uh, capitalism, and I have to deal with all this all the deficiencies of 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 a system that has not has not grown through trial and error as as, as Berg was saying, so that's why I, that's why I stumbled on 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 these views and then I and then I started to realize that uh, that he actually had to, many things to say about the economy and that was interesting and important to to bring this up because he's mainly taught only as a political thinker but uh, his economic view is is actually very coherent and it complements the pic his his political uh, picture basically because most of his answers are in a way also political uh, political answers taking our first question matthew Derek thompson asks how far do you think the idea of home extends is it perhaps national boundaries or economic boundaries in other words is it a nation or a trading group that is home i think what roger would have said is 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 that the, that the nation has nothing to do with with boundaries it's 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 not a it's it's not a political unit it it, it is the way it, it is the way uh, uh, around it, it is if if there's uh, if there's a place of home, a political unit will uh, will will emerge. So again, obviously, our political units today, the na the nation states, are sort of the frame in which we in, in which we move. So they're a natural way in which in, in which membership uh, takes takes place. But I mean, for example, in the case of Great Britain, would Roger have considered? Great Britain as a nation? No, he would probably have considered England, England as, an, as, an, as a nation and Scotland as another nation, not from a political perspective saying that they have to be independent, or, but from a, from a perspective of, of, of community. So we have to forget a little bit the, this, 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 political, this political aspect of, of, of the nation. As I mentioned, first it's, it's a place of attachment and, and, and I think we're all attached to, to a place of home no matter how much we've traveled or how much we've moved in the world, like, like, like myself. But we have that ancestral feeling of, uh, of, of home. But one can be at home in, in a place where he's not been born, as, as long as, 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 this, as this is the place where he sees others being part of this place. I mean, Roger sees this as a community, as a community of, of, of love, as a, as a place where we're able to share and to, to sacrifice for, for each other. So I think it's a, it's a much more vague concept than than just a nation from an, in a political sense or in a or in a racial sense or in in, in, in terms of, of language a nation is 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 where this we sentiment is is prevalent and you can have small nations you can have bigger nations and you you, you this can be part of of you can be part of, of of several nations the important thing is that this is something that binds us question from sunny chen thank you so much for your prelude to a great thinker's economic view my question is if the market cannot preserve tradition culture and beauty does that mean we can trust the state and politicians to do so i think roger would say no definitely and definitely not because that is exactly the, 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 the problem. I mean, Roger will say that, that the market doesn't provide all the, all the solutions. It does not achieve all the objectives that we have in life. The market is simply the best way to organize our economies. And it's been proven by the failure of, of, other, exper of other experiments that, that the market and, and what is crucial, 
the free market and, and the free establishment of, pri of prices is the best way to organize the, the economy. But it doesn't mean that the market, and, and Roger highlights the, the, the issues that arise around globalization, the destruction of our, envi our environment, con 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 consumerism. But the answer, the worst answer, is to let the state intervene. Because the, because the state ultimately will will destroy freedom and 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 the the initiative, it will tend to to create. I mean, obviously, I mean there has to be a there, there has to be a state and the state has a function. But the function of the state should not be uh, to intervene in in all orders because it just takes away that sense of duty and sense of responsibility that is at at, at the root of the, the creation of the of the communities so no the state is not the uh, is not the answer of to the to the failures of of the of the market paul talson asks i can certainly see the influence of hegel on how you describe roger's economic thought but you referred to his kantianism how do you think this impacts his economic thought if at all perhaps perhaps a dualism that resigns the markets to the realm of cause and effect is this a weakness of his thought? I think this is a very good question. And uh, who, who's asked this question? Uh, uh, this is Paul Towson. Paul. Uh, yes, Paul, uh, Paul. Paul raises a very, a very good question. Yes, indeed. Roger is also very much influenced by, uh, by by Hegel. But again, this was a presentation where I was trying to limit myself to to twenty twenty five minutes, and I could not cover. Uh, all, all the all the thinkers that I would have liked to cover, especially because Hegel is is a relatively complex thinker. What I have to say is that 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 Roger is fundamentally uh, a Kantian. So the worldview, the, the view of the world is is the is the view of Kant, and is this this view of that 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 I that I mentioned uh, of the distinction between a physical uh, world and uh, and the Lebens and a Lebensfeld, and this he takes from from Kant. So this is what what sort of orders and shapes uh, his his whole thinking, but yes, indeed, um, he 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 takes a lot of the uh, I mean, he he takes a lot of ideas of Hegel, and one of the main ideas that is present in in Hegel is that ultimately society has to provide a place of settlement. That that is what Hegel tries to achieve with in his philosophy of right, which with, with what is called in German Sittlichkeit and, and in English is translated as ethical order, which which is uh, which is which are the institutions that 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 have to pro have to provide, if rational, they have to provide this this uh, place of settlement for for individuals. So it is a very interesting. It is a very interesting topic, and Paul was is absolutely right. Uh, he's influenced by by both. But I wanted to highlight uh, his his Kantian because it allowed me to to explain his his dualism. Jake Scott, who is the editor of the Mallard, writes and asks: Sir Roger was particularly critical of absenteeism, especially in the field of agriculture. Given the fragility of supply chains revealed in the coronavirus crisis. Do you think a Scrutonian economic response would not involve greater state involvement in the agricultural industry to both stimulate innovation and encourage local agriculture? Do I interpret the question to be if, if Roger would have thought that, that following COVID, the state had to take a bigger role in, 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 in the agriculture? If, if, that's, it's, if that's the right interpretation of the, of the question, and, and Charlie, correct me if I'm wrong, my answer is also clearly uh, no. Uh, again, um, Roger was very adamant to keep the state out of uh, any economic uh, sector because he, he, th he thought he, it would just lead to what I mentioned, to an overclass of, of, of bureaucrats that, that will feed themselves on more and more regulations and an underclass of people who, who would be looking at the state to provide them uh, to provide them the, the, the means that they don't want to provide themselves by by hard work. Well, I wanted to ask you about one thing we didn't touch on tonight quite. And it, it's a little bit of a tricky concept, which is where does the fundamental need for profit tie in with this? Because profit is a very complicated thing when we're talking about, you know, ideally what, what Roger saw as the best way to think about the economy and the best way to engage with this and run it. With something like profit, can you ever entirely 
take it out of that sort of greed that Aristotle warned us against when he when he talked about the art of acquisition and the need for putting fruits of your 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 enterprise towards a greater good. Again, I think that that I mean, Aristotle is is one of my heroes. I mean, in, in I start I, I I did my MBA MA on 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 the Nicomachean ethics of of Aristotle. So again, I there's so much I found in Aristotle, but um, it's not necessarily his understand his his un, the understanding of the economy that that I would highlight as his uh, as his as his forte. And coming back to 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 the idea of of profit and uh, and, and and Roger, I think that that Roger Roger was in favor of the of the market economy, and and and, and again I've explained the the the, the basic, but. A profit is 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 a necessary concept because it has to be explained through motivation. I mean, you if you have a, a free actors and free free agents, what motivates them not only but but partially is 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 profit. So profit is 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 another signal is another form of knowledge. Where there's profit, there's some there's something that that you can there's a product that you can deliver there's a service that you can deliver that that will be useful to to somebody if there's a loss it, it is an indicator that it is probably something you should not be you should not be doing so in in that sense profit is use is useful to driving the market and and profit in a in a way is is just an inevitable because it, it is the motivating factor of, of a free agent and, and again underlying all of Roger's thinking is that freedom is, is one of the, the essential values and you cannot just restrict uh, freedom because where do you start? Who restricts the freedom? Who has the, who has the ability to choose how to restrict free, freedom? What Roger would also say is that prof, profit is not all, again, and this is what I've, what I've tried to explain also to, uh, tonight. We are not maximizing rational beings. We have so many, uh, so many other aspects that, that matter, that, that, that are important to us. So he would not endorse profit maximization for the sake of profit maximization. He would not endorse greed, which is ultimately what, what excessive profit, profit uh, maximization in, in, entails. And he also said that actually, and, and, and again, this is also something that I agree and that I've experienced, that companies... The, the really big, the, the, the really successful companies, they normally have a purpose. Yes, they they are born of the out of the idea of an entrepreneur or they, or, or several entrepreneurs, and and they have a mission beyond beyond profit. Companies that that want to survive long term is because they have this this purpose. And profit is simply a byproduct of having the right purpose and delivering on on on, on this on this purpose. So. This is this is another way of of seeing that that profit is not something that, that it, it 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 is part of the of of an of a natural and well functioning economy. The problem is the problem is 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 greed and, and maximization of this profit. Diego asks, don't you think that don't you think that Roger's use of a particular theory of human nature to justify social arrangements is very similar to the ones that he attacked all his life? And I think Diego's referring slightly to the communitarianism, which is often ascribed to Roger, that he was, as you said, he, he was not a sort of socialist or an environmentalist who he was a great critic of, but rather, in a strange sense, a kind of reluctant capitalist with leanings towards, as you said, civil associations, the nation, state. The communitarian thinkers, I'm not a political scientist, so I don't know. I mean, they, and there's many communitarian, many communitarians, and, and they say this, they say different different things. What I would say is that Roger is, is the important thing is, and, and this is to coming back also to one of the, um, the very good questions that was raised. Roger's not putting the community in the first place. Yes, that's the, that's the, that, that's the important thing. For Roger, and and this this comes also from from the from from Hegel. The community and is 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 born out of the their interaction between between the people between the I, between the you and and and, and the other. So and it's based on freedom. So first there is there is the individual and is this this individual that in in contra in contraposition to 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 the other 
starts on understanding himself as as a as a person this is this this um, this this process and this is the process by which also hegel justifies property he says property is 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 not only a social or a legal event it's a psychological event property is a way of, of of manifesting that i am that i'm different from the other but at the same time i have to respect the other because i have to respect his property so it's it's a it's a mutual dependency that is that it is established so again that's what i think what roger would would um would see different roger is is really very skeptical about about anything that that is not based on on our own uh, personal human human experience and communitarians would put the community first and the individual uh, second and for for roger uh, community also only emerges out of this the, the 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 concept of the human person within the company or the corporation is it, itself is there something where the top the manager the ceo can put forward and influence his or her employees because or, or would roger say entirely it is it's actually the collective responsibility of all the employees in a sense to take up these values because how, how would uh, what i'm interested in is how this might work internally within one firm or one company where perhaps um, some of our viewers uh, work in their day-to-day -day lives i don't think roger had has has uh, has said anything about this specifically so or at least i don't know that 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 he's that he said something about it i think he he was not particularly interested in in the, in the company as such because he thought it, it it was an organization for a specific purpose and and he was more interested in 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 things that that had more to do with with membership where the objective was not only a specific purpose, but also the membership, and he didn't see exactly the company as as uh, as, as fulfilling this uh, this role. Whether I agree 100% with that, I do, I don't because I think that 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 the corporation has uh, to play in 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 society and in civil society. And again, if I would to give if I would give you my 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 own answer i don't think that the, that the company has a collective responsibility or an abstract collective responsibility but a company is, is certainly part of a part of a community and and it, it is embedded in this community and and i think that for a for a company also the objective is to is to make the company a place of uh, a place of settlement for 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 the workers because that gives stability and that that gives the company the the opportunity to go go and undergo crises companies that 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 sort of work at the at, at the limit of of their possibilities are the companies that normally fail when when the when the business cycle comes and the business cycle always uh, uh, comes so yes i do think that that you could be including the, the the company into this idea that that they are part of the community and that they have to be responsible but this is not something i what i wanted to say is this is not something that that i've heard roger saying specifically thomas we've come to the end of our session tonight and just before we say night there is one more question from me um if you could and this is something we like to ask all of roger's students and our speakers which is your recommended reading for our audience tonight, which of Roger's works would you recommend that they go away and read, and uh, what other works tied into your themes tonight would you like? Would you recommend to them? The the good thing about Roger is that you can read, read any of his books, and and you and you will uh, you will you will you will like them. In in terms of in, in terms of what 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 has occupied us tonight, I think there's one book that I would definitely recommend, which is called Green Green Philosophy: How to Think Seriously About uh, uh, About the Planet. Uh, and and again, this is I mean, I said that he never wrote a book about economics, and and that's the case. But he wrote a book about the environment, and it, and and there are some and there are lots of economic ideas there. So this is the book that I would definitely recommend. It's not an easy book, uh, I have to admit. <laughs> Because it's a very dense book. There's many, many ideas, and there's many, many, many thoughts. But it's a book that, if somebody is interested in in Roger's ideas around the economy and the environment, that he he should uh, definitely read. In terms of um, other other books that that I I would rec uh, recommend, and I've mentioned uh, this issue about Roger's cognitive dualism. I would recommend the book that he. He recently uh, published, and that was a book. Was one of the books that that 
attracted me to Roger, which is called Human, Human Nature, in which he explains uh, the issues that, that, that I've only touched about very, very, uh, very briefly. In terms of, of, of reading other, other authors, again, I, I couldn't recommend, I mean, definitely uh, Hegel's philosophy of right is, 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 is a masterpiece and uh, extremely interesting but i have to say that it it is very difficult to uh, it is very difficult to read so i don't i don't know if i i can wholeheartedly recommend it if somebody has has the energy to 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 go through it i would definitely recommend because it's a fascinating uh, book maybe maybe what i can recommend is that when when somebody tries to read uh, the the philosopher right, they take one of these study guides, and there's a, there's one which which is, is again I I wouldn't say it, it is it is the best, but it's a good one, which is by Dudley Knowles, a professor from from Glasgow Glasgow University. So I think those are the the and if somebody wants to 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 read something about the other economist that that I mentioned, Wilhelm Röpke. He writes about the humane economy, although I've explained that, that Roger has uh, certain criticisms uh, about his, his, his position. Thomas, thank you so much for speaking to us here tonight. I, I think that was so informative and eloquent and beautiful. So thank you. And I hope that we will get to get to have you back and have you speak on a panel or again on this topic. So it will be very, very, very pleased to, to spread Roger's uh, message because I think uh, it's a very important message. Yes, absolutely. And finishing also the green philosophy. Ah, green you have it. You have it. I've you, got... have, you have it there. You have it there. Good. Excellent. Indeed. Um, in all fine bookstores uh, available to be delivered to your house uh, in COVID times and in all fine bookstores when we are back out. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tonight. We wish you a good night and thank you for joining us.